So in this video, what we're going to be looking at is the concepts of efficiency and free trade. So keep in mind, by having supply and demand, we do technically already have trade occurring, right? We have the producer trading their goods and services, selling their goods and services to the demander, the consumer. And thus, we have that minimum willingness to accept that maximum willingness to pay. And so we have trade within the market itself. What we're going to be looking at here is that expansion of, say, domestic or local trade to international trade, the trade between two different countries or even sometimes two different regions, two different provinces. And we'll take a look at the efficiency gains that can be had by opening up to trade and the benefits to be had there. What we'll also be looking at as we carry on is how by putting in things like tariffs or voluntary export restrictions, these are all sometimes also known as quotas, not to be confused with our quotas we looked at in price controls, but how by putting on these restrictions to free trade, how we actually lower our overall efficiency and we end up being worse off as a result of this. To finish, we'll be taking a look at some of the arguments and uh, benefits of international trade. So some of the arguments being what we've seen in the world around us recently as to why we should restrict trade. And then some of the benefits as to, well, okay, other than this increase in surplus, what are some other reasons why we'd actually want free trade? So let's take a look at this idea of trade to get started. Let's jump over. So, okay, for our idea of trade, what we have to begin, let's just take a look at a market. In our market, we're going to have our axes. And of course, we'll have our initial price and our quantity. And then let's go use our demand as such and our supply being upward sloping. So, okay, that's my supply, marginal cost, minimum willingness to accept. Downward sloping, that's my demand, my marginal benefit, or my maximum willingness to pay. At equilibrium, at equilibrium, we get our market price and our market quantity exchanged. Right? And what I want to do here is I want to kind of go and say this here is my supply, and I'm going to say this is my supply domestic. Right? This is my domestic supply for these goods and services. And truthfully, that's my domestic demand as well. But we're just talking about our specific market. So I'm not really going to make that distinction there for the demand curve, but definitely for the supply curve. What we have is we then have from this our domestic price. I'm going to call this price domestic and our quantity exchanged right typically we just call this q sometimes we want to denote it as something special we'd call it q prime well okay here we go we have trade between our consumers and our producers but what happens if all of a sudden we open up to trade with other countries other regions and they have different prices they can do things cheaper they can do things more expensive right they have a different price in their domestic market how does this all work out? How does this all figure itself out? And okay, are we better or are we worse? That is, say we liberalize to trade with somebody who can produce everything cheaper. Are we actually better off in that case? Or do we just export all of our jobs to their cheaper production? Hopefully, if you recall back to how we started off this semester with our trade chapter, we realized that, hey, trade is not determined by absolute costs, but by comparative costs. And that is by really that comparative advantage. So even if a country can do everything cheaper, well, there's going to be a difference in opportunity costs and there's always going to be room to gain from trade as long as there's actually that distinction between opportunity costs. So one of the things we're going to be taking a look at. First, we need to take a look at, though, in order to expand upon this, in order to kind of get how we wind up from this point here, we need to take a look at a concept known as the law of one price. That is loop, the law of one price. And what the law of one price is really getting at is that any globally traded good or service will be traded at one price price right it won't be traded at one price in one place and a different price in another place no no no. it'll have the exact same price everywhere where it's bought and sold if it's a globally traded 
or even just a traded good or service. And so formally what this looks like is it looks like price domestic times our exchange rate plus our transportation cost, I'm going to call this T small c, will equal our world price, right? And so that world price, this would be really in terms of foreign good. And what we could do is we go through all of this and say, yeah, okay, my domestic price is going to be one and the same, including any transportation costs as what the world price is. And we have this one price everywhere, right? If we have these any slight deviations in domestic prices, it's because of exchange rates and transportation costs. But typically in the long run, we'd expect these to equalize out. We're going to simplify this a little bit. We're going to presume, right, just because this is an easy assumption to make, we're going to presume we have a one-to-one -one exchange rate. So that is one Canadian dollar for one US dollar, one Canadian dollar for one euro, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a stretch, right? That's an exaggeration of reality for sure. But it's a simplification that just allows this uh, really to be a lot easier, right? So that we don't have to worry about exchange rates and what you have to trade one for another for. So that's just for ease there. Transportation costs, we are going to presume that these are zero. And in reality, for the vast amount of goods and services out there, these are in fact pretty close to zero. Right. If you think about we put massive amounts of T-shirts onto a cargo ship to ship across the world, well, that cost per T-shirt for transportation approaches zero. Right. You might be looking like $100,000 to ship your T-shirts, but because you're shipping a few million T-shirts, that cost per T-shirt is approaching zero is exceptionally small. So for most goods and services, this is not an exaggeration to say. So in that case there, if we make these two assumptions, this is going to simplify to be price domestic equals price world. That is, our domestic price is going to always just be stabilized to the world price. The world price will always be the prevailing price. And that's the big thing to keep in mind. The world price is always going to prevail. And attached to that, a reason as to why that's the case is kind of an assumption that was kind of implicitly there, but not, not stated. So let's take a look at that. This is an implicit assumption that we have a small economy. That is, we are, whatever good we are buying or selling from the world on whole, we are small in relation to the world. If we make t-shirts, the amount of t-shirts we supply to the world is hardly consequential, right? No one's going to notice if Canada stops making t-shirts. Or they might, but they're not going to significantly notice. Very similarly, if Canada was a demander of coffee, if Canada all of a sudden decided, yeah, you know what, we don't want coffee anymore, well, again, that's not going to be a huge impact on world markets. We're not really going to influence it too much one way or another. We're just too small on the global stage. Truthfully, this whole idea of a small economy and this international trade thing, this works well for most countries around the world, right? For most countries, for the stuff we buy and sell, we are a small economy. The exceptions to this, the exceptions of this truthfully would be the US, they would be a large economy, the Eurozone together, and China. Right, those three, they would be definitely large economies. This wouldn't really apply to them. We'd have some exceptions to make, some different rules to look at beyond the scope of 103. That'd be more if you get into a trade theory course. So outside of those three economies, everybody else would be a small economy, and thus this would apply just fine. Well, let's see why this law of one price works, right? Let's see why, why this is the case. And let's suppose we're talking about we're talking about jackets and we have here in Canada, let's say we have the price of a jacket is $100, but the global price of a jacket is going to be, well, let's say the global price is going to be 150. So, okay. Global price is 150. It's like, whoa, why is that the prevailing price? Like, we're willing to do this for 100 here in Canada. Why would we be doing this global of 150 instead? Why would I buy a foreign jacket 
if I can buy a domestic jacket for $50 cheaper? Well, you're right. Why would you buy a foreign jacket for $150 if you could buy a domestic jacket for $100? Perfectly legitimate question. But here's the flip side of this question. Are producers of jackets, right? So they'd be able to produce and sell jackets for $100 domestically. But if we open up to trade, our manufacturers, our firms, what would they rather sell jackets at? Would they rather sell jackets to Canadians for $100 a jacket? Or would they rather sell jackets globally for $150 a jacket? Right? And keep in mind here, we've assumed that our transportation costs are zero. So that is just direct comparison of price that the firm gets to sell it for. In this case here, what's the firm going to want to do? They're like, yeah, okay, I could sell it to Canadians for 100 or I could definitely sell my jackets abroad for 150 So in this case here, they're like, yeah, sorry, Canadians, this market kind of wins. This foreign market seems a lot better. This is where I'm going to be sending my jackets to. In this case here, this global price prevails and price of jackets in Canada would rise to meet this global price. What about if we had another good, right? What if we had another case here? And let's say that in this case, I don't know, let's keep in with this textile theme. Let's go t-shirts. And let's suppose that price domestic for t-shirts was something like 15 a t-shirt, but the global price was 10. So in this case, right, just domestically without any trade, without any international trade, producers, consumers, they're coming together, market forces are determining a price of 15. But then as we liberalize to international trade and we can start buying global t-shirts, that is shirts from foreigners, well, we now have this lower price. Well, the producers, They'd rather be like, no, 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 let's just keep the price at 15, guys. Like, this is good. $15 t-shirts. Let's keep this going. But the consumer, you and I, we take a look at this and we go, oh, Canadian shirts for 15? Exact same shirt, but made abroad? Going for 10? Well, that's exact same. No difference in quality, no difference in workmanship, color, anything like that. It's just a homogenous good. If I can get that exact same good for $10 rather than $15, the consumer is saying, I want to buy this one, right? And because there's so many available globally, all the consumers say, sorry, Canadian producers, we want foreign shirts. As a result, this would end up pushing down our domestic price until it reached the global price. So in each case, what we saw, T-shirts, domestic price went down to the global price. Or in this case here, our jackets, jackets went up. Oh, let's make our colors match. Jackets went up to match the global price. So in that way, there are a law of one price. Whenever we have a discrepancy in prices between what we could domestically produce it for or the global price, it'll always be the global price that prevails. Okay, let's go back and take a look at our supply and demand and take a look at that. So here we go. Let's say that this is our jackets, right? This is the first case we were looking at. And to give it some context, what did we say? We said that the price domestic of jackets was $100. That is, we could produce jackets for $100 here in Canada. This is where we would be at if we did not have any international trade. But okay, then we liberalize, we open up to international trade, we begin trading with the Europeans, the Americans, we begin trading down into South America, over into Asia, etc, 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 right? We open up into this international trade, and we find that the global price of t-shirts, sorry, jackets, the global price of jackets is going for $150. $150, right? This is going to be price world, price global, where this 100 this was my price domestic, right? Domestic price because domestic supply, domestic demand. Okay, so what happens given this new world price? Well, given this new world price, I go to my demand curve and I say, 
wow, at this high price for jackets, I don't want as many jackets as I used to. So my demand for jackets falls. My producers of jackets, though, they take a look at this and they go, wow, okay. If I get to sell my jackets now for $150, not just $100, but $150, well, that's going to encourage me to make more jackets. So, right, we ramp up our jacket production and we get up to our new place on our world supply curve. Well, the amount we'd supply given the world price wrap. So based off of this, we get the amount that we're willing to supply versus the amount that we are demanding. And if we went back to our last video where we were talking about local economy, we'd say, okay, look at this. We have a problem. We have excess supply, right? We have all of this being supplied, but we're only demanding this amount here, right? That's problematic. Producing this much, consuming that much, excess supply is just going to go to waste. But not in this case. Not in this case. In this case, all of this excess supply, that is from demand all the way out to quantity supplied, all of this extra supply is what I'm going to export. This is how much I'll end up selling to other countries, other regions around the world. So if I have a case of international trade, this excess supply is actually my exports, what I end up selling to the world. So Okay, what has happened? We've had a high world price, so we've decided we want to start selling to the world because firms are saying, hey, we can make more money. They produce more jackets. Keep in mind, right, if we go back to our whole production function, quantity is a function of labor and capital. So, hey, if we wanted to increase our quantity supplied, we'd have to increase our labor in the short run increase both in the long run, right? More labor, more capital altogether as we shift into this long run and can change both. So altogether, more factors of production needed domestically. We increase all that to increase our quantity supplied and we start to sell it more abroad. Cool, firms clearly winning here, right? If you look at that, exporting all this, well, okay, your workers are, they're winning too. Labor is up because quantity produced is up. So things are looking pretty good. Well, on the other side, what happened to the consumers of jackets, right? You and I, winter's coming, we're cold, we're looking for jackets, and we're like, yeah, okay, it's not bad. We used to spend 100 bucks for a jacket. 150 for a jacket, what's going on? What's the big change? Well, the big change is we're now competing globally. Global markets are not as good as making jackets as Canadians are. That's why the world price is so much higher because they are not as good at making it as we are. So we want to sell at their price because they have that higher price. And so you and I, we now face that higher price in purchasing. And so our quantity demanded falls, our domestic quantity demanded falls. We don't buy as many jackets anymore because ah, they just cost more. Final kind of thing, so how many jackets do we buy? Let's use this in blue. We end up buying, well, that's not the tool I wanted. We end up buying between quantity demanded and, I guess, zero there, right? We end up buying these many jackets. The thing is, given our law of one price, all of these jackets that we end up buying all the way up to QD, all of these jackets, these jackets are all being bought and sold for $150. Meaning from your perspective, it doesn't actually matter if it's a Canadian jacket, a Chinese jacket, an Indian jacket, a American jacket, a European, it could be a jacket from anywhere in the world. If this jacket is being sold for $150, and given our assumption that these are homogenous goods, meaning they're all the identical jacket, well, okay, we're going to buy some of these jackets domestically. We're going to buy some of these jackets from abroad. Some are going to come from China. Some are going to come from America, etc., etc., etc. So that is, even though we are exporting jackets on whole, some of these guys that we buy, they may be 
domestic, they may also be imports because we are indifferent between whether or not it's a Canadian or a foreign jacket if it's just costing us 150. So this here is really explaining why sometimes, actually quite often, when dealing with trade flows, you will see something like Canada can, uh, no, I forgot an A, maybe let's, uh, you know, write our country a bit better there. Canada, we will find that they will be an exporter of jackets, but then we'll find that they also import jackets. Or Canada is an exporter of crude oil, but yet we also import crude oil. And at first that seems to make no sense. You're like, why would we export it if we are then just turning around and buying it from somebody else? Well, it's because really we're exporting it altogether. We're exporting a ton because we have all this excess supply. The stuff we import was just out of convenience. Sometimes it's just easier to deal with sell sellers, firms down in Washington State than it is to deal with sellers, firms out in Ontario. In that case there, Ontario would be a domestic purchase, all part of Canada, where Washington State would be an import because it's coming from the U.S. So in that case there, just out of ease, out of simplicity, we're like, sorry, we're going to import this jacket because it's right there rather than shipping it all the way across the country. Just out of ease, just out of convenience, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because we paid $150 for it either way. So quick little rundown of our case where we had a high world price resulting in exports. Let's take a look at a different scenario. Okay, in this scenario here, we're going to take a look at another case. This time we'd like to look at the market for t-shirts. And suppose, okay, we have our domestic price of t-shirts. Let's suppose that this was, what did we say? I think we said 15 for a t-shirt. Great. We have our Canadian production of t-shirts. We have the amount that Canadian producers are willing to supply at 15. They're supplying Q. At the same time, our domestic demand for t-shirts at 15, we are demanding Q. So we have equilibrium, right? Quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. Then let's suppose we liberalize to international trade. We begin training, or training, trading abroad. And so as we begin to trade abroad, we find that globally, foreigners are much better at producing t-shirts than we are. And so because they're much better at producing t-shirts than we are, they have a lower price that they're able to sell their t-shirts for. So, okay, they have this lower price that they can sell their t-shirts for. Law of one price, this world price, global price prevails. So what happens at this new lower price? Supply curve, I'm going to have my new quantity supplied. Demand curve, I'm going to have my new quantity demanded. So, okay, here's my new quantity supplied underneath trade. Over here, this is my new quantity demanded underneath trade. So what has happened? Well. First of all, given this new low price that prevails, our producers, our suppliers, they can't compete, right? They were producing Q before, and they were happy that a whole bunch. But at this new lower world price, our quantity supplied begins to fall. We begin to shift along our supply curve all the way down to this world price. What we witness happening is a contraction of this industry, right? This isn't an industry that we have a comparative advantage in. This is why our domestic price is higher than the world price. Foreigners are better at making this than we are. So we witness this contraction. We decrease our quantity supplied. We're not able to produce nearly as much. And we end up down there. The industry typically doesn't completely collapse. It rarely goes all the way to zero. Typically, we just witness a contraction. So, okay, keep in mind, again, right, this is our quantity supplied, how much stuff we produce. Our quantity supplied is a function of labor and capital, which means, hey, as I end up decreasing my quantity of t-shirts, well, in the short run, 
that means that I'm going to be decreasing my labor force. In the long run, well, I'm going to have less labor and less capital. And so, ah, uh, all of a sudden I'm laying people off. Don't need as much capital in this industry altogether. That is, this industry is contracting, right? This is the scary part that everyone's like, oh, see, look, trade is bad. We're losing all of our jobs to foreigners, right? And this seems to emphasize that point. Uh, we'll come back to that, right? We'll come back to that point. Wait, what about on the other side? Well, on the other side, T-shirts are now relatively cheap. So the demander, you and I as consumer, we're saying, wow, at that cheap price of T-shirts, I'm going to increase my quantity demanded. And we move along our demand curve to our new quantity demanded at the world price. Our distinction between the two, right? Again, if we were back in that previous chapter of price controls where it was entirely domestic economies, we'd be taking a look at this and we'd be saying that we have excess demand. We have more that we want to buy of t-shirts than we're able to produce. Oh, this is problematic. But in our case, we're a small player. We have all this excess demand for t-shirts that our local producers cannot satisfy. What do we do? Well, we just go to the world. We go to the world, we go to foreign producers, and because we're so small, we could demand as much as we wanted at this world price, and global producers would be able to satisfy that. So in this case here, excess demand means that we are going to be net importers of t-shirts. We're going to be importing t-shirts on whole. So we'd have this happening there. Okay, we've taken a look at the export side. We've taken a look at the import side. Let's kind of bring this all together so we can kind of witness what's happening here. Well, let's jump and take a look at where this all fits in. Okay, so in this case here, we've seen this diagram before. We have our market for jackets. We have our market for t-shirts. And here I've purposely done a non-linear production possibility frontier just to really show us that reality that we do not fully specialize. We don't go all the way into producing the thing that we're best at. And here what we have is we just have our domestic economy, right? We have just our local country. We have our suppliers. We have our demanders locally before we've liberalized to trade. And so... We're producing off our domestic production possibility frontier between t-shirts and jackets. From here, we get our quantity exchange of jackets, bouncing off quantity exchange of t-shirts, and then we get the corresponding market price of each. Okay, we're all happy, we're good here, but then we go and we liberalize to trade, right? We open up to free trade, and as we open up to free trade, boom, yellow here, we get our new world prices, right? In the case of jackets, the world price is higher, so we increase our quantity supplied of jackets to match. Well, as we increase our quantity supplied of jackets, that means we had to decrease our t-shirts, right? Keep in mind what we're talking about. We needed more labor, more capital to make more jackets. At the same time, when we're talking about our t-shirt market, we said, oh no, we're making fewer t-shirts. We had to let go of labor. We had to let go of capital. Well, okay, keep in mind what's happening is that really, we're let going of labor and capital in the t-shirts to move them into the jacket market. That's really what's happening. And what we've done from our supply side of this is we've now shifted into more jackets and less t-shirts. So if you followed our quantity supplies through, right, our quantity supply would jump up to here on our production possibility frontier. That is, we begin to specialize in what we are relatively best at and what we have a comparative advantage in. We don't go all the way to the corner because I don't have a linear PPF, right? So I'm not going to ask you to solve this kind of scenario because we've only done linear PPF, so don't get freaked out about that. We just see movement towards what we're specializing in. And that's the big takeaway. So if I'm increasing my jackets, I've decreased my t-shirts and thus my new quantity supplied of t-shirts. But okay, that's our production side. Production is still based off of our production possibilities frontier. It seems like, hey, we're still on that frontier. We said, hey, we get gains from trade. We end up outside beyond that frontier. 
So let's see if that's the case. Let's use blue for my quantity demanded and let's follow through where my new quantity demanded is. So right there, let's start off with our t-shirts. So if I take this amount here and I bring it all the way up, straight line, hit my bounce. So, okay, this is my quantity demanded of t-shirts. It bounces off of this line and I'm just gonna bring it right now to that production possibility frontier. Okay, let's go down to jackets. World price over right there at jackets. Let's drag that guy down. So, okay, what's this guy? This is my new lower quantity demanded of jackets, right? Higher world price, I don't wanna buy as much. So that new lower quantity demanded, let's drag this line up. Oh, we notice they don't intersect, right? But they do actually, because this is our quantity demanded. This is how much we are buying all together, right? Keep in mind, all this excess demand, this was satisfied through imports. Over on the right hand side here, all of this excess supply, this was all sold off as our exports. Right, and in all this extra money we got from selling jackets at a higher price than we would have been able to, gave us extra money to be able to buy more t-shirts. So as a result, where does our quantity quantity intersect over here in the amount we're actually able to consume? Well, the where it intersects and the amount we're able to consume is out over there, which clearly, this point here is clearly off of our production possibility frontier, clearly beyond our production possibility frontier, and thus clearly we are much better off by engaging in this international trade rather than just having trade within our domestic markets. We get a much higher level of consumption altogether, and thus a much higher level of quality of life, standard of living, etc., etc. Now, the fear with trade often is, hey, boom, this t-shirt sector where we're importing t-shirts, we just had this destruction of our t-shirt sector, right? Quantity of t-shirts produced fell. And as we stopped making t-shirts, all of those t-shirt workers got laid off. All of that capital that was in the t-shirt sector got just depreciate it's no longer there it's no longer good for anything oh no what a waste foreigners have stolen our jobs but no they haven't keep in mind that yes this sector contracted but the only reason why the jacket sector was able to expand the only reason why we were able to get more jackets produced is because we took that labor, we took that capital from the shrinking sector. So that is jobs were not destroyed due to trade, jobs were displaced, they were reallocated due to trade. Our production, yeah, our production still stays on our PPF, right? We're still just producing now, instead of at that white intersection, we're now producing at this yellow intersection here. But despite producing at the yellow, we can now consume beyond our production possibilities out at the blue point. So all of this really just to wrap together everything we've looked at this semester so far, starting off with our production possibilities frontier, trade off, how we come up with trade, that into our supply and our demand diagrams, and then now bring it all full circle through the law of one price to see how it all fits together. Where are we going for the rest of this video? Well, in the next video, what we're gonna be taking a look at is we're gonna be taking a look at surplus analysis with and without trade. So how we conduct the surplus analysis, what is our welfare before trade? What is our welfare after trade? So right, if we wanna take a look at that, here we go. We had areas, let's say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, just to keep listing them all, we take a look at, hey, which one of these was our consumer surplus before trade? What is our consumer surplus after trade? 
Same thing for producer surplus, same thing for social surplus. And then we'd work out, are we better off or worse off altogether because we've put trade into place? So we'll take a look at that in the next video. Outside of that, what we'll also take a look at is what happens if we start putting trade restrictions into place? What happens if we start putting in tariffs? We start to engage in this isolationism. We say, no, we don't want trade. We're going to limit. We're going to put in restrictions, some barriers in order to protect our local industry. Well, does that actually create jobs? Does that actually make us better off or does that make us worse off? That's all the kind of stuff we're going to analyze in the next video using all the tools we created in this video. So, okay, big takeaways, summary of this video, if you will. First of all, law of one price. That world price prevails, right? That's the big one. And we'd always move from whatever our domestic price is to that world price, either making us a net importer or a net exporter, depending on whether the world price was higher or lower than our domestic one. The next kind of big takeaway is that really this all wraps back around to where we started off with our Ricardian trade theory. And this whole idea of comparative advantage and opportunity cost is not actually lost on us, right? The reason why we can produce jackets so much cheaper than the world can was because we had a comparative advantage in jacket production. Hence why when we liberalize to trade, we move towards making more jackets less t-shirts yes we're not using this linear ppf anymore that's fine we're not going to be playing around in this world any longer we're going to be focusing in on one single market just the jacket market or just the t-shirt market but we have to kind of keep in mind there is a bigger picture out there and these do file through to each other right if we forget that we often take a look at our import markets and we go, oh my goodness, we're worse off because we have trade. No, 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 there's always the both sides of the coin, right? And so it's always worthwhile, always good to remember that they both relate to each other. This is pretty much just a theory video then, taking a look at the basics of that, how things relate. If you have any questions about that theory, really reach out to me either on D12 frequently asked questions or by email to clarify them because it's this theory that we will then apply and work through in the next video. So let's take a look at that.